Welcome to Covenant Theological Seminary's webinar series on topics relevant to ministry effectiveness. My name is Joel Hathaway, Director of Alumni and Career Services, and I'm here today with Dr. Mark Dalby. Today's discussion on grace-based leadership is led by Dr. Dalby, President of Covenant Seminary and Associate Professor of Practical Theology. Dr. Dalby believes that grace-based leadership is strong, messy, calm, gospel-shaped, spirit-empowered, missional, collaborative servant leadership. Dr. Dalby, good morning. And what exactly does that mean? Good morning, or afternoon here in St. Louis, I guess. Uh, it's good to be able to, to be a part of this today and um, appreciative of those of you who are, are with us and look forward to uh, not just presenting some of my thoughts, but hearing some of your questions and even some of the ways that you're finding both struggles and even successes in some of the some of the things we'll talk about. So, I uh, three years ago, um, things were beginning to unfold in a way that uh, I was being asked to take more and more leadership in various ways here at the seminary. I came over 15 years ago to be dean of students, and then was added to the faculty in addition to being dean of students. And Dr. Chapel asked me to be vice president of academics and faculty development. And then the board asked me um, if I would be interim president. And then I said, okay. They asked if I wanted to be actual president. I mean, not be actual, but be a candidate for it. And I said, no, I don't think I can be interim and be a good can and be a candidate at the same time. They drafted me in at the end, long and short of it, here I am, year and a half into being actual president of Covenant Seminary, a position I never aspired to or dreamed I would be in, but suddenly thrown into the trenches of trying to figure out a whole lot more about leadership um, than I'd ever had to figure out before. So that's uh, part of what I've been going through. So one of the things as I go about and, and meet with people and churches and alumni and so on and so forth is, you know, I, I teach worship while well, I get asked to speak on worship. I get a little of that. My wife and I teach a class on gospel centered parenting, and we've got asked to do a couple of those, but increasingly what people are wanting to hear are thoughts on leadership in the church in this season that we're in. So I've been trying to figure that out myself, and uh, I just started developing adjectives that related to what I'm learning from the trenches of the leadership of the presidency at, uh, at Covenant Seminary. Part of this goes back to when the Search committee asked me, okay, Mark, if you become president of Covenant Seminary, what kind of leader uh, will you be that you think is important? And so I, of course, started out by saying, I want to be a servant leader. I think that there's probably widespread agreement that if there's one thing Jesus taught about leadership in the church, uh, leadership in, for, for those who are followers of him, is that it's to be servant leadership. Um, as one of my uh, friends who has owned a family business for a long time, he's actually on the board of trustees, says, my job as the person in charge of this place is to get as low as I can get, to get underneath the people in the organization and the workers and try to lift them up. That's his description of, of servant leadership. I. Uh, I received an award when I was uh, in my junior year of college. It was a scholar athlete award among small colleges, the NAIA at the time. And uh, I got a note of congratulations from a pastor friend of my dad's. And he said, great job, Mark. Glad to hear you got this. And he said, remember, walk under chairs. And I thought, what does walk under chairs mean? And uh, as I thought about it, in what was an awful lot of sort of pride and arrogance that I got this wonderful award, I realized he was saying, be humble, uh, get low enough to walk under chairs and recognize that um, God's the one who gave you capacity to have any kind of success like this. And uh, so that, that has uh, stuck with me um, over the years. So a leader in the Church of Christ or as Christians serving him in other kinds of vocational places um, is to be servant leadership. That's fundamental uh, and primary. Um, the second thing I told the committee is I want to be a collaborative leader. Now, what does that mean? Well, 
I recognize that um, no one individual, and certainly not me, uh, have has all of the gifts necessary to lead a church or a family or an organization or to do our jobs. We need the gifts of other people around us. And uh, we need people to be able to give honest input, uh, insights that they have, even push back to some of our ideas to help shape it toward a better place, a place that would be toward the agreed upon mission that we have. Um, for instance, here at the seminary. So, um, one of the things that um, I expressed to the search committee and believe wholeheartedly myself is I need the multi-gifted people around me to have access to give their insights, to express their opinions, to even disagree uh, lovingly without me receiving their input as being adversarial or against my good ideas. So collaborative leadership, I think, is, is simply consistent with what the New Testament teaches about many kinds of gifts, one body. There are people who are in positions of leadership, um, but they need to be listening to and benefiting from um, the gifts of people uh, around them. So that's, uh, that's an important part. That's not an easy thing. Um, to do. Uh, when you really give people permission and they feel free to say what they think, sometimes they may say things what they think in ways that aren't necessarily as kind as you wish it would be, or sometimes it's about them, um, or sometimes they just sort of hold on to something and try to get their agenda in despite what everyone else around them might be saying or what you as a leader um, may think. And so collaborative servant leadership actually requires the third thing I've been learning is that I have to be a strong leader. I don't start with, I'm the strong leader, I'm in charge, this is a hierarchical structure, I don't care what you think, this is what we're going to do, I don't want your input, and it's about you serving me, not me serving you. So servant leadership and collaborative leadership are foundational, but the one who is put in the office or the position of leading needs to be stewarding that leadership position well, which means at times you have to be a strong collaborative servant leader. Um, you have to exercise wisdom, but you also have to exercise strength. If you let people give input to help shape what you'll do going forward, sometimes you can hide behind, I'm just going to be collaborative forever and we never make any decisions and everybody's feeling good about giving their input and you're not going anywhere. So, one of the things you have to do is, it's been hard for me because I like people to like me and um, I like people to feel like they, uh, to, to get what they think is important. I've, I've had to make some decisions that nobody really wanted exactly the way I decided. And yet, they have the opportunity to go with it because they've helped to shape it. So hopefully people will be able to see um, their, their hand, their fingerprints on decisions that are made, um, even if it isn't exactly the way uh, they, they would have liked it to be. So I tend to be a person who um, has to be uh, encouraged toward being strong, being able to make decisions that people might disagree with, but I think that's a vital part of leadership if you're going to steward an office or a position that you have. It takes a kind of courage that I think uh, the scripture calls us to, to live out our calling in our place of leadership, serving the people, listening to the people, but still being strong enough to make decisions and take things forward. Well, what happens when you're both collaborative and strong? Well, there, there's going to be conflict. Um, it's going to be messy. Um, no matter what you do, you're a sinful leader leading sinful people. And at times things will get crossways. At times um, people will um, you know, work behind your back. They'll try to undercut you. They'll um, try to persuade people against you. There are all those sorts of things that happen. and. It just gets messy. Um, I like to say about 
local churches, um, in many ways, all that we learn about uh, dysfunctional family systems where you have sin patterns that are hidden or secrets and how you deal with that. In essence, those struggles in family systems don't get let at the, left at the door when people come into the church. In some ways, a local church is one combination of a highly, oftentimes dysfunctional uh, family. And so there's going to be conflict. It's going to get messy. And if you're a leader that can't stand messiness or you try to lead to avoid any messiness, um, it's going to become problematic. I've had to learn that um, in some ways that, uh, <clears throat> that have been challenging. Um, and I've had to make some hard decisions in my role um, at, uh, as president of Covenant Seminary that, that have been hurtful to people without my intending it to be hurtful. But they were decisions that needed to be made. They were weighed. People had input, and uh, we had to go forward with them, and then deal with the messiness that follows. So, um, strong, messy, collaborative servant leadership are some of the things that I'm learning. So, what happens when conflict uh, happens? When the messiness um, gets pretty uh, difficult. People raise their voices. Um, people say my way or the highway, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, what does a leader have to do in the midst of the fact that things can, can and do get messy? Well, a leader has to stay calm. Um, if you're trying to lead people uh, through something, overcoming conflict, and you enter into that conflict in a way that you yell and scream and lose it and whatever, you basically forfeit your capacity to lead well, to lead in a way that's following Jesus. And so, how can you be a calm leader when you're churning inside and you uh, want to see uh, things go a certain way, you get caught up in the crossfire of other people? This is a vital thing and, and uh, obviously, as we'll talk in a moment, this is one of the places that this kind of leadership can only happen when it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. The kinds of things we're called to are beyond our own capacities left to ourselves. So staying calm is one of those ones where um, what we sometimes call a non-anxious presence from the leader enables the temperature not to get as high, people to listen to one another, people to remember why we're here and where it is we're going and how we need one another. Um, to go toward that. So strong, messy, calm collaborative servant leadership is sort of the progression as I've learned um, some of these things um, over the last few years particularly. The next one, the fifth one, is gospel-shaped. Um, a leader needs to be captured and captivated by the gospel himself or herself. What that means is that um, the leader recognizes that uh, the chief sinner in the room is him or herself, the leader. Um, and my need for the gospel as president of Covenant Seminary is as great, and in my case I would say greater, than anyone else at the seminary. So I have to be, as, as uh, Jack Miller often said, the elders of the church, the leaders of the church need to be the chief repenters in the church. Part of your credibility to be, to be able to lead others in this way as you follow Jesus um, is to be um, willing to repent, to be willing to own your part in things, um, uh, to be quick to acknowledge where you failed people. Um, and that's uh, that rather than losing credibility and leadership, I find gains uh, credibility and leadership. Now you can't do that in a manipulative way um, and people can see through that uh, as well. My friend Zach Eswine uh, years ago uh, helped me understand a phrase that he used called redemptive vulnerability. Leaders need to be willing to be vulnerable but they should be vulnerable in a way that is for, re for, the, for redemptive purposes. Um, it's caring about people, it's not making it about me even as I repent that it's all about look what a great repenter I am, sort of I then need to repent of my repenting as some people would say. But to be 
one who repents quickly and then stands strongly in the grace that is offered in Christ. It's the gospel movement in my own life throughout each day um, that is, I think, an important part of this gospel-shaped leadership. People see my need for the gospel. They see me um, being willing to have people show me my blind spots and ways that, that I'm not leading effectively. Um, one of the ways I've grown in leadership at Covenant Seminary is I have people around me who um, I've invited and have given permission to, uh, and I run things by them ahead of time, to say, what am I missing here? Where am I um, not effectively leading in ways that, that are consistent with the gospel? So strong, messy, calm, gospel-shaped, collaborative servant leadership. At the end of the day, these things are only possible if leadership is Holy Spirit empowered. One of the things I've learned in this role as president of Covenant Seminary is I'm absolutely convinced that everybody everywhere, every moment of every day is absolutely dependent upon God. Um, that's sort of a given. We know that to be true. We're designed that way. The Bible instructs us that way. Um, however, our conscious awareness of our dependence upon God and our acting out of our dependence upon God varies from day to day and moments within a day. One of the things in the current role that I'm in, uh, which I feel more called to than anything I've ever done, but at the same time is the hardest thing I've ever done, is I'm more consciously aware, more often consciously aware, of my complete dependence upon the Holy Spirit to empower me to be the kind of leader that I believe God is teaching and showing me from the trenches of leadership um, that I need to be. Um, another thing in Zach's book, uh, Sensing Jesus, um, is he talks about um, many of us in leadership in ministry uh, believe and people are glad to try to make us be as though we have to be God for people. And I think that's, that's a very dangerous place for us to be. It's a very dangerous place for people to expect us to be. And the emphasis on just being, I'm an ordinary sinner saved by grace who's been filled with the Spirit, given certain gifts, had certain training, being put in a position of leadership that I have to steward well. But I'm not um, omnipresent. I'm not omnipotent. Um, I'm not omniscient. I can't be everywhere for everybody all the time. I can't know the answer to every question they have, and I can't be powerful enough to make life change to be better for everybody. And so part of this Holy Spirit dependence is being willing to say, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure how to help you, but I'm here. Let's look to God and ask Him to show us. Um, I can't be with you right now because I have to be with X, Y, or Z. Um, that I have to be present with at this particular time. One of the things we need to do while stewarding a place of leadership is restoring in our own minds and the minds of people we serve that we're just ordinarily human beings like everyone else um, who are called to a particular time and place to lead uh, in complete dependence upon the Holy Spirit. And let's lead people out of our own dependence on the Holy Spirit to recognize that it's God who provides he uses us as human instruments, but we're dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Then the final one, the eighth one, um, is missional. Um, Grace-based leadership is strong, it's messy, it's calm, it's gospel-shaped, it's Holy Spirit-empowered, and it's missional. Um, leaders have to lead somewhere. Um, leadership is not simply maintaining the status quo. Leadership is... Um, in the presence of God and other people who give input, uh, figuring out where God wants us to go. He has a mission that, that biblically is clear. It's to extend the gospel to the nations, to the generations, into every area of life uh, as the Great Commission goes forth. Um, how do we figure out in our little piece of the world that God has given us how he wants to work in us and connect what he, uh, we are doing um, to what he is doing. Some of you are certainly familiar with uh, 
Abraham Kuyper's uh, statement about there's not one square inch of this world over which Christ cannot say, this is mine and I am Lord. Um, Brad Matthews and uh, Mike Williams and I taught a course this summer calling vocation and work. And one of the things we talked about is how do we steward our square inch that God has called us to in a way that is not have this sort of elevated view of our self-importance. It's just a square inch. But it's a vital square inch in what God is doing to reclaim and restore this world and to capture us and make us part of his ongoing um, mission. So those are, those are some of the things I'm learning. Um, Grace-based leadership, strong, messy, calm, gospel-shaped, Holy Spirit-empowered, missional, collaborative, uh, servant leadership. A couple of the passages that I put out there um, for you to consider are some places I've been sort of living in that I think bring this out. The Second Chronicles 20 passage about King Jehoshaphat, when the enemy armies come up, how does he respond? Well, he, he calls the people together and he cries out to the Lord and it, it's got messiness and he remains calm and you know, he's, uh, he, he's recognizing the dependence upon God and, and all these, these various things. That's a place where a lot of these come together. Another place I noticed is in the, in the uh, upper room. I refuse to call it a discourse because it was not a lecture. It was a meal. So the upper room meal with the disciples where he did a lot of teaching and instructing and modeling of servant leadership. Reading through, as I run, I listen to passages of scripture on my iPhone and I listen to that about 15 days in a row, 13 to 17. And just recognize a lot of these things I'm learning are embedded in what Jesus both models and instructs and calls his followers to there. Another place is uh, Acts uh, 20, the second half of the chapter, uh, where Paul is giving his last sort of word to the elders at Ephesus. Um, and again, I'm seeing a lot of these things are there in a sort of throughout the passage kind of saturated way as Paul's instructing, reflecting on his own leadership in Ephesus and then exhorting and encouraging the elders there and the kinds of leaders. So I won't take time to go through those passages, but those are three passages where I think if you think of this filter of these eight things, I think you can both see them there and, and root a lot of these things um, in passages uh, like that.